For as long as humans have gazed at the moon, some have dreamed of exploring our nearest neighbor. This mysterious object of wonder. But when future generations look back, they may be surprised to learn why men first went to the moon. Because the ancient dream of exploration had almost nothing to do with what was called Project Apollo. Any idea that the Apollo program was a great voyage of exploration or scientific endeavor is nuts. People just aren't that excited about exploration. They were sure excited about beating the Russians. On October 4th, 1957, Russia orbits the first man-made satellite in history, Sputnik. To many Americans, it's a shocking defeat, a Pearl Harbor in space. It is quite possible that an aggressor nation that dominates space will then dominate the world. We just can't let that happen. The consider the control of speeds around the Earth uh, much like, uh, shall we say, the great maritime powers considered the control of the seas in the 16th to the 18th century. And uh, they say, if we want to control this planet, we have to control the speeds around it. Dr. Werner von Braun is America's leading rocket scientist, a German engineer who created the V-2 rocket for Hitler in World War II. He now works for the U.S. Army. For years, von Braun has dreamed of exploring space. Thanks to the Russians, he'll get the chance. Nine months after Sputnik, President Eisenhower creates the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. NASA announces Project Mercury, a program to put an American in space. These ladies and gentlemen are the nation's Mercury astronauts. The seven Mercury astronauts become instant heroes, Cold War warriors, ready to battle communism in space. Future celebrities like Alan Shepard and John Glenn are the public face of America's space program. But even the Mercury astronauts had no idea what was already going on behind the scenes at a little-known NASA laboratory. Here at the Langley Research Center in Virginia is where Apollo began. Even today, few Americans realize that in the 1950s, a tiny group of engineers was already planning trips to the moon. They were called the Space Task Group, visionaries dreaming remarkable dreams. One of them, Dr. Maxime Faget, will become a legend helping to create every American manned spacecraft. In 1958, he's designing the Mercury capsule. We expected to land on the moon sooner or later because it was so close and because everybody could see the moon. It, it, it made a very good target. In the 1950s, travel to the moon is about to become possible because of the rocket. Long used as a weapon, the rocket is the only engine that can operate in a vacuum. Rockets are becoming more powerful in order to carry nuclear bombs. Some of them can now reach space. For an astronaut to survive there, he'll need the protection of a spacecraft or capsule. Even a small capsule will need a huge rocket to put it in space. Overcoming gravity takes enormous amounts of fuel. So the rocket is divided into stages. As each one burns its fuel, it drops away to save weight. By the time the capsule finally reaches space, the rocket that put it there is gone. Weight is a problem for the engineers from the beginning, and it will affect every decision they make. The most basic is how they will go to the moon what the engineers call the mode. There are two possibilities. The first, direct ascent, 
uses a single rocket to send a spacecraft to the moon. It's the way people have always imagined going. But sending the spacecraft all that way will take an enormous rocket, larger than the Statue of Liberty, a monster called Nova. There were actually designs for the Nova rocket, but uh, could you build it? And the real issue about the Nova rocket is the question is, could you build it? And if you did have a problem with it, it could really destroy a good part of the Cape Kennedy at the time because it was such a massive amount of propellant. Werner von Braun favors a different mode, Earth Orbit Rendezvous, EOR. EOR uses two smaller rockets. One sends up the spacecraft, the other sends up the fuel. The astronauts rendezvous with the fuel tank, fill up their spacecraft, and head for the moon. Direct ascent is simple, but needs a huge rocket. Earth Orbit Rendezvous uses smaller rockets, but it's more complicated. Picking the mode will be the most critical decision in the Apollo program, because it determines everything. The spacecraft, the rocket, the training, budget, and schedule. The wrong choice means losing to the Russians, and maybe not reaching the moon at all. The answer was one nobody expected. The engineer who lobbied for it was an outsider. He didn't belong to the space task group and never worked for von Braun. Almost no one welcomed the idea, but he never gave up. The story of his struggle is largely unknown, but the plan he promoted got America to the moon. His name is Dr. John Hobold. In 1959, he's adamant both modes, direct and Earth orbit rendezvous, will fail, because the spacecraft needed to land on the moon is much too large. It was a vehicle about the size of an atlas. Down at the Cape, it takes 3,000 men, a launch pad, and a launch facilities to get an atlas off the ground from the Earth. They were going to land something the size of an atlas on the moon backwards with no help whatsoever. I thought that was preposterous. Hobolt suggests not taking the main spacecraft down to the moon at all. Instead, the astronauts will use a separate lander, a small taxi or bug. One time we call it the lunar excursion vehicle, sometimes we call it the bug, sometimes we call it the lunar schooner. But the idea was that we go there we go into <clears throat> orbit around the moon, then make a decision to land. So we would land with the small lander, but keep the command module in orbit. He was the lonely vigil observing everything. After we explored, we'd take off again, as ascend, make the rendezvous again with the uh, command module, dispense with the lander because it's done its job, and then we'd return to Earth in a very normal way. This is Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, LOR. By using a separate lander and not taking the mothership down to the moon, LOR saves fuel and weight. Hobolt promises LOR can get America to the moon with one rocket, and it won't have to be the huge Nova. But the astronaut's safe return depends on rendezvous, something no one's ever done, even around the Earth. Hobolt's plan requires that rendezvous work perfectly at the moon. To almost everyone, that seems insane. Well, when I first heard about lunar orbit rendezvous, I said, my gosh, <laughs> we don't even know how to rendezvous in Earth orbit yet. No. <laughs> how, how are we going to be able to assure ourselves that, that uh, we could get the two vehicles together in orbit and, and dock together at the moon. That seemed like a very chancy thing. Uh, I remember expressions like, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of, the most unsafe thing. How could anybody go up there and land and, and rendezvous 250,000 miles away? John Hobolt goes on a crusade for LOR, making presentation after presentation. Though he did not invent the idea alone, Hobolt has become its main advocate. 
and he's beginning to annoy some powerful critics, like Max Faget. Well, Humboldt was a rather pushy guy, there's no doubt about it. There were a lot of people who had their minds made up that we already knew how we were going to do it. And he had considerable discussion and argument, uh, some of it pretty heated. At a meeting here in headquarters, Max Fischer got up on the table and pounded, and he says, don't you listen to him, don't listen, he, his figures lie, his figures lie. We had this, this little discussion going, which <laughs> personalities got involved. <laughs> to some degree that he was crucified that day, uh, uh, chastised, um, uh, the system uh, was considered to be uh, risky, uh, unsafe. By April 1961, John Hobolt has been pushing LOR for two years and getting nowhere. But he's about to get some help from an unexpected source. On April 12, 1961, the Russians put the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. It's the worst defeat for America's space program since Sputnik. And it puts the pressure on a young president who's only been in office 12 weeks. Thank you, Mr. President. 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 Mr. President, uh, don't you agree we should try to get to the moon before the Russians if we can? If we can get to the moon uh, before the Russians, uh, we should. And isn't it your responsibility to apply the, uh, the, uh, the vigorous leadership uh, to spark up this program? When you say spark up the program, we first have to make a judgment based on the best information we can get whether we can be ahead of the Russians to the moon. We're now talking about a program which may be, uh, which are many years away. The Saturn is still on a 40-hour week, isn't it, Mr. President? Saturn is still going to put us well behind. Two days after Gagarin's flight, Kennedy has White House counsel Theodore Sorensen ask NASA what space project might beat the Russians. Their answer? is a moon landing. Can we be the first to do that? Can we beat the Russians to that? They said, yes, that is sufficiently far off that the US could probably, uh, if it started now, uh, have a chance of beating the Russians to that. That I knew Kennedy would be interested in hearing. Sorensen reports to Kennedy. In Sorensen's mind, it is the decisive moment. And he said, I think we ought to try for the moon. There are a lot of tough things uh, we've got to figure out first, but uh, I think that would be the way to do it, if we can do it. But not everyone agrees. Members of a committee led by Jerome Wiesner of MIT are against going to the moon, or even putting a man in space at all. Their secret report warns that the death of an astronaut could seriously embarrass Kennedy. Kennedy will keep his moon decision quiet until NASA proves an American can go into space and come back alive. That man will be Alan Shepard. Unlike Gagarin, Shepard's flight will be shown on live television. If he dies, the whole world will witness it. An accident on the very first flight would cast a long shadow over the U.S. space program. Once again, hearts are beating faster and people are tensing. The signs of the final minutes of countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition. Lift off, lift off. Fire on the deep left bird and she's lifting clean. Ice coming off that redstone. You can hear the roar now. She's going up right flame underneath the rocket. That rocket is going up straight. She's climbing straight. He's pulling teeth now. The launch is perfect. For the next 15 minutes, the world will hold its breath. We appear to be losing voice communication now. During re-entry, 
radio cuts out, as expected. To millions of viewers, Shepard has disappeared into the unknown. Main shoot is green. Main shoot is coming unraised and it looks good. This is it. You should hear the newsmen here right now. They are absolutely screaming and shouting. They've been jumping up and down. It is a tremendously successful. With the enormous response to Shepard's flight, Kennedy will now make his moon decision public. Two days before he addresses Congress, NASA gets a draft of the speech. And the one thing that, that really concerned us was that he, he'd included the date of 1967. And we felt that that was fine for planning and for, you know, for, for managerial purposes, but that the country should not stick its neck out to that extent. And so right there, the call put into Ted Sorensen, who, a, who said, as you can imagine, well, what do you recommend? And uh, and Jim Webb said, well, within the decade. Uh, to some people in this uh, the new decade, uh, started January 1, 1970, uh, technically it began January 1, 1971. So there was a little fudge there, and Kennedy just decided to keep that fudge. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. America is headed for the moon. Not only has Kennedy made the decision, he's set a deadline. But NASA engineers can't really get started until they decide the approach mode, how to get to the moon. After two years of frustration, John Holbolt risks his career, bypasses channels, and writes directly to NASA Associate Administrator Robert Siemens. November 15, 1961. Dear Dr. Siemens, the important question is, do we want to get to the moon or not? I'm simply trying to establish that our LOR scheme deserves a parallel frontline position. Respectfully yours, John C. Hobolt. And it was a blistering letter. And I first thought, well, I wish that guy would get off my back. I mean, uh, he, I, uh, maybe I should call his boss, uh, the director of the laboratory, and tell him that, you know, you're not really supposed to cut across, I don't know, six or seven layers of management that way. And uh, but I thought, but he's, I think he may be right. Siemens tells Brainerd Holmes, the head of manned spaceflight, to do a careful evaluation of LOR. And then it wasn't more than a week or two later uh, when I was talking to Brainerd, and he said, you know, we are seriously considering it and it is looking better and better all the time. I tell you, within a month and a half's time, they were touting the virtue of Lunar Rendezvous by the November time frame of 1961. But I think even though they, they accepted Lunar Rendezvous, they accepted Hobolt. And I think John was never received, ever received the, the proper uh, uh, credit. In July 1962, NASA announces America will use Lunar Orbit Rendezvous to reach the moon. I grew up on the farm, working 16 hours a day, milking cows in the morning under 20 below zero and everything. And to me, to know that I've been involved with one of our greatest achievements of mankind, I, I feel rather special about that. NASA has made its decision, but Lunar Orbit Rendezvous is still just theory. If it fails, the astronauts will be stranded at the moon forever. John Hobold is convinced rendezvous will work. Now it's up to the astronauts to prove he's right. It will take precise flying at extremely high speeds with little margin for error. This is why military test pilots were selected in the first place. To rendezvous, they'll need a spacecraft they can maneuver, a true flying machine. 
controlled by the pilot. But the primitive Mercury capsule is not it. All we could do in Mercury was put it up and fire the retro rockets and bring it down. We couldn't maneuver the vehicle. We could change, couldn't change its inclination, couldn't change its altitude, couldn't do any kind of operations in space. By 1963, Mercury's six flights are over. Apollo is still on the drawing board. Can two spacecraft rendezvous? Can man survive a two-week trip to the moon? Can he get out of the spacecraft with nothing but a suit for protection? All essential questions, and no way on Earth to answer them. Lost between the pioneering flights of Mercury and the lunar triumph of Apollo is the program that found the answers. It was called Gemini. Nearly forgotten today, Gemini was the essential step to the moon. Gemini came along as kind of a, a step in the middle. As a matter of fact, we were doing Mercury. People began to work on Apollo. And then a, a number of people realized that there was a whole bunch of things that we could do in Earth orbit that we would like to do there before we ever went and tried them at the moon. Using a sophisticated two-man capsule not much bigger than the old Mercury, Gemini will test rendezvous, long-duration flight, and spacewalking. All important, but none more critical than rendezvous. Everything was based on doing a lunar orbit rendezvous. All the hardware was sized to do that. The performance of the command and service module, the lunar module, the Saturn V booster, was all based on the assumptions we could successfully do a lunar orbit rendezvous, except nobody had ever done one. In December 1965, the first rendezvous attempt in history begins. Two Gemini flights lift off a few days apart. It will be a dress rehearsal in Earth orbit for what they'll need to do at the moon. Wally Shira and Tom Stafford will play the part of the lunar lander. They'll try to rendezvous with a mothership flown by Frank Borman and Jim Lovell. Within a few hours after their launch, Shira and Stafford can see the other spacecraft. Hey, I think I've got it. Is that spacecraft seven? Now it's in Shira's hands. To close in, he's got to maintain precise control. But every maneuver consumes precious fuel. The whole thing of rendezvous is, is exquisite timing, delicate little touches. It's all little tiny maneuvers. So you had to really get in there and use both hands and pitch and roll and move and translate, and you were flying formation with it. Separated by only a few feet, each craft is actually moving over 17,000 miles an hour, like one car tailgating another at breakneck speed. Only superb control keeps them from drifting apart or crashing together. It's everything meant by the phrase, the right stuff. Ask them what their range is now. Uh, six, what's your range? Yeah, we're sitting up here playing bridge together. We're in formation with seven. Everything is go here. We did it. Uh, Roger, congratulations. Excellent. Pretty uh, Roger. Wally Shiraz piloting and careful use of fuel prove rendezvous can work. Wally was a perfect choice for that. Went out of his way to do it by the book and exactly within and better than the fuel consumption estimates that had been made. Following their rendezvous success, Shira and Stafford returned to Earth. Frank Borman and Jim Lovell remain in space to try a 14-day long-duration flight. It's a test to see what will happen to the human body on an actual moon trip. By the time we flew on Gemini, they knew that your eyeballs weren't going to change. They knew you could drink. They knew you could sleep. The fears were just, could you perform after, uh, say, a week in space up to the level that you expected to? We really didn't know how the body would sustain that long a period, and we had to know that in order to go to the moon. Unfortunately for Frank Borman, this flight is primarily a medical experiment run by doctors. One of the things that I learned uh, in the NASA program is you give the doctors an inch, they'll take a mile. So I launched with an EEG 
needles stuck in my head and everything else you could think of. Just to be confined in there like a sardine in a can, that was a real trial. And of course, you're sitting right next to your companion, and for two weeks being with Frank Borman, like two weeks being with Frank Borman any place was a real challenge. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Frank had a book called Roughing It, uh, which uh, we were trying to read. Uh, we also sang to each other. Nat King Cole at that time had a very popular song, Put Your Sweet Lips a Little Closer to the Phone. Put your sweet lips a little closer to the phone. Let's pretend that you and I are all alone. That got on our minds, and we sang that damn song for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we still sing it occasionally. They can joke about it now, but in 1965, Borman and Lovell are medical guinea pigs. They've survived 14 days weightless, but even the doctors have no idea what will happen when they return to gravity. Yeah, they were concerned on landing that when all of a sudden our hearts were uh, pumping the blood in a 1G environment that we might have problems or pass out. Some of them even thought we'd die, but uh, we never even got dizzy. I actually, for the first couple hours, actually had almost command my legs to, to say left, right, left, right. And, uh, and my mother was watching on TV, and I later saw it on a, on a film. It looks like I had my pants full because I was walking very, very, you know, very deliberately. One thing, uh, when they got back on the carrier, they noticed is that all the other people smelled a little funny. <laughs> They'd been cooped up in this front seat of a Volkswagen for two weeks. By the time they got out of it, I think they were very happy to get out of it, although they didn't probably realize how bad it had gotten. So far, Gemini has succeeded brilliantly. But the final challenge to master is extravehicular activity, EVA. Within a few minutes, he fogged over. We were so naive, we didn't even think about putting defog on our visor like you, you do when you go snorkeling or scuba diving. And so he was huffing and puffing, and I was flying the spacecraft. He says, Tom, I've got a hard time controlling myself. And it was a very, in retrospect, uh, somewhat of a hair-raising thing. And there were probably times where there were people down here on Earth wondered whether I'd get back in because my heart rate was running at 170 beats a minute. I said, hey, this is not a good situation at all. NASA downplayed the concern, but losing an astronaut during EVA was a very real fear. Hours before the flight began, Deke Slayton, head of the astronaut office, had spoken to Tom Stafford in private about the unthinkable. Tommy says, NASA management wanted me to let you know if something happens to him out there, and if he dies, You've got to bring him back because we can't afford to have a dead astronaut floating around out there. I looked at him and I said, we've never talked about this before. Cernan is getting his oxygen from an umbilical hose that passes through an open hatch. Stafford must fly the spacecraft. If Cernan dies, there's no way Stafford could pull his body back in, get him into his seat, and shut his hatch. The only way Stafford could possibly bring Cernan back is to re-enter the atmosphere trailing his body with the hatch still open. The Gemini would be in front, but this thing is going to be whipping us all around. I says, and furthermore, I've got an open hatch, and all I have is this thin suit when it was in up, just one layer of nylon, and I've got 3,200-degree plasma coming a couple of inches right above my shoulders through that open hatch. So he's got seven layers of insulation. That's not going to help him too much. He's dead anyway. But I've got one layer here, and this, this plasma's going to come through the hatch. And then suppose we even get through all that. Then a pilot chute comes out. Is that going to get snared with what's left of CERN? And then here comes the main parachute out. Is that going to get snared and, and with what's left up there? And so here I'm going to plop down in the ocean with a space with a hatch open. What happens then? And he says, well, what should I tell NASA management? And I uh, said, so probably I'll cut him loose. If he really is dead, I'll do all I can. But if he's dead, there's, I mean, there's a good chance you're going to jeopardize the spacecraft and me, too. Stafford was just going to literally have to cut the cord and 
I might still be a satellite out there uh, traveling through the sky 20, 30 years later. For Stafford, the unthinkable has become all too real. Forget the EVA. All he cares about now is saving Cernan's life. So I, I called the ground and the contact said, I've called it quits. I'm going to get him back in before we go in the next night time. Got him in. Finally, he just couldn't hardly move. And then when he opened his visor, he was absolutely pink, like he'd been in a sauna about an hour too long. The next day, we landed. And they flew the suit right back to Houston. They had over a pound or a pound and a half of water out of each boot. But he lost, I think, 10 pounds, 10 and a half pounds in two hours and five minutes outside. The next two attempts at EVA are scarcely any better. Everybody forgot Newton's third law of motion. To every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. And when they touched the spacecraft, the spacecraft repelled them. As engineers, we started saying, look, we've had three missions where the EVAs didn't go well. What was wrong? Then we had a science advisory team step in and say, look, your entire principles of EVA are wrong. How you train, how you prepare the crew, the kinds of tools and instruments that you use. For the next attempt, the capsule will be equipped with special handholds and footholds to anchor the spacewalker in place. But the biggest improvement is neutral buoyancy training, practicing underwater, the closest environment on Earth to weightlessness. On the final Gemini flight, the new training and tools make all the difference. What has been nearly impossible is now easy for astronaut Buzz Aldrin. I, I felt that it was a piece of cake outside, just m moving very slowly. Uh, there was no challenge. Certain things come naturally. You, you decide that you're going to move in a certain way and you need leverage, so you, you just don't allow yourself to get out of position. Uh, and you know, it, it just takes a little bit of patience and understanding. In November 1966, Gemini comes to a triumphant finish. A late addition to NASA's plans, Gemini has proven every technique Apollo will need to reach the moon. We had to learn how to do all the things to prove that they could be done before we could even begin to think about going to the moon on Apollo. And Gemini, in its own historical context, was perhaps as important as Apollo, because without Gemini, there would have been no Apollo. We had finally figured out how to do EVAs without fogging up the visors. We'd figured out how to do rendezvous. We figured out how to do long duration flights. Now suppose we had never done any of this. Say, whoopee, we're going to the moon. And never done Gemini. It would have been a disaster. It is January 1967. 10 weeks since Gemini ended. The new Apollo spacecraft is nearly ready for its first test flight. The crew is Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. Chaffee is a rookie. This will be his first flight. Ed White flew once in Gemini. He was the first American to walk in space. Gus Grissom, one of the Mercury 7, is the most experienced. This will be his third flight, and he intends to go even farther. Gus, uh, what do you think your chances are for an Apollo flight? I think they're pretty good. I expect to be around for most of the Apollo program. You think you will one day make one of the trips to the moon, then? Uh, I'm, I'm planning on it. Shortly before launch, there are two critical tests. One is for leaks. They seal the capsule, pump up the pressure inside, and see if it holds. The second test is a practice countdown, a dress rehearsal for launch. The crew is in the capsule, the hatch sealed, and the spacecraft filled with pure oxygen. To save time, NASA does both these tests at once. They check for leaks at high pressure while the crew is inside in pure oxygen. The combination is lethal. 
we had 15 PSI of pure oxygen in that spacecraft. And fif at 15 PSI of oxygen, aluminum burns. After years of doing this same test on every Mercury and Gemini capsule, NASA has become complacent about pure oxygen at high pressure. On January 27, 1967, their luck runs out. There are communication problems, and Grissom is frustrated. You copy? No, I didn't read you, Chuck, at all. I, I can't read you, Chuck. You want to try the phone? How do I get the moon? We can't talk between three buildings. I can't hear him. I hear the red. Jesus Christ. Have you guys talked together up there? It's a ram module? Ironically, the end of the test is to be an emergency escape drill, but it never gets that far. At 6.31 p.m., somewhere in miles of wire, a spark jumps. I was looking <clears throat> at a TV on my uh, launch director's console. I saw a, a flash, and uh, 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 the spacecraft really burst into, into flames. We heard these screams in the, in the intercom coming from the spacecraft, and we heard the people on the pad yelling and, about a fire. In the high-pressure oxygen, the fire quickly becomes an inferno. Seated in the middle, Ed White is desperately trying to release the hatch, but the hatch opens inward. When the spacecraft was pressurized, there was no way Ed White could pull that hatch inward. I mean, it was tons of force holding that hatch closed. It takes pad technicians five minutes to get the hatch open. And when they did, our crew had expired. It was like a stomach punch for everyone in the program. And everybody, no matter what role they had or what part they had in it, I think had a sense of guilt about it. Somewhere, somewhere along the line, one of us must have missed something. And therefore, we let our crew down. Roger was so energetic, so enthusiastic about the whole program. And we're sure that as long as he had to leave this world, he's happy in his spaceship anyway. No anger at what's down at Cape Kennedy. What will continue, what will follow? None whatsoever. The price of progress comes high at times. In the aftermath, NASA conducts a painstaking investigation and finds the Apollo spacecraft is full of design flaws and sloppy workmanship. Worst of all is poor quality wiring, the most likely cause of the fire. Over 100 design changes are made, a hatch that opens outward in seven seconds, better shielding on wire, better fireproofing, and for all ground tests, no more pure oxygen. This spacecraft never left the ground, yet it may have contributed more than any other flight to the goal of reaching the moon. I hesitate to say this, but uh, I have to say it. I don't think we would have gotten to the moon in the 60s if we had not had the fire. That's a terrible thing to say, but I think it is true. If that had happened while we were on the way to the moon. We'd have lost the crew, never heard from them again, and it would have been a, just a mystery hanging over the whole program, which would have caused an untold delay, and maybe even a cancellation. But no matter how improved the new spacecraft may now be, it still cannot reach the moon without a huge and powerful rocket. The Saturn V. 
Mercury and Gemini used reconfigured military rockets intended to carry warheads. The Saturn V was created solely to explore space. It stood 363 feet tall. It weighed six million pounds, but over 90% of that weight was fuel, a million gallons. All that fuel didn't last long. The five engines of its first stage burned 15 metric tons of it every second. This was the only rocket that could send Apollo to the moon. And there was a time when no one knew if it would even work. By 1967, rocket and launch complex are ready. T -minus 60 On November 9th, at 7 a.m., Rocco Patron's launch team lights the candle. You count up, and at six seconds, roughly, you, you give the first signal to burn. When the engines all reach correct thrust, the rocket sends a command. Let me go. A hold down arms release. The swing arms retract. The Saturn V is on its own. some of our safe bases when it actually went off properly. And I was with Werner and, and some of his team there, and they said, we just can't believe it. It all worked. To me, it was the opening of the space age. Once we had that bird launched, I knew then it was just a matter of time until we got to the moon. The Saturn V has worked perfectly on its first unmanned test. In little more than a year, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders will become the first men to ride a Saturn V. It will take them all the way to the moon. Thirty years later, Nova joins Borman, Lovell, and Anders at a reunion in Chicago, a chance to look back on the perilous journey that was Apollo 8 and to recall the mysterious way it began. North American Aviation. Frank Borman, please. This was all super secret. They wouldn't even discuss it or allow us to discuss it over the telephones. Yeah. And that's why the reason I had to fly back to Houston and get told in person. And then uh, even though we had changed our mission... Didn't you we... know before you actually got on the airplane that there was going to be a change? I did not know. I did not have any idea no. until I walked into Slayton's office. Honest to God. Well, let me ask you, what did he, did he give you an option or did he say the mission has been changed? No, he said uh, that the Russians, had, the CIA had heard that the Russians were going to launch before the end of the year and that Lowe was coming up with this plan to uh, send Apollo 8 to the moon and what did I think about it? I thought, that's a hell of a good idea. <laughs> it take me 30 seconds, I committed you guys. <laughs> See that, Bill? He said, hey, Bill and Jim would really love to do that. <laughs> Three days after leaving Earth, Apollo 8 is approaching its target. But the moon is invisible, hidden in shadow, lost in total darkness. It was very black. All there was we could see over our shoulder was a black hole with no stars. We assumed that was the moon. In fact, the only time of the flight that my hair kind of crawled on the back of my neck uh, going into this big black hole. Mission planners have calculated the precise instant the crew should be able to see the moon emerge into sunlight, if everything has worked perfectly. Uh, one of the things that would tell us if we were on track or not was uh, a certain point in the flight plan when we'd look down and see the sunrise impacting the, uh, the uh, lunar surface. And I, I remember my, the awe that I had for the people that had done all this calculation. At the exact second we were supposed to see it, there it was. 
something caught my eye out of my window. And these were the lunar mountains coming up the window. It is humankind's first look ever at the far side of the moon. It was a lot rougher than the front of the moon, the side that's always exposed to the Earth. We were like three school kids looking into a candy store window. Our noses were pressed against the glass. We forgot the flight plan. Then, something happens that no one has predicted, and it turns out to be an even more amazing sight. When I looked up and saw the Earth coming up on this very stark, beat-up lunar horizon, an Earth that was the only color that we could see, uh, a very fragile-looking Earth, a very delicate-looking Earth, I was immediately almost overcome with the thought, you know, here we came all this way to the moon, and yet the most significant thing we're seeing is our own home planet, the Earth. Though their mission is to photograph the moon, all three men focus on the Earth. Bill Anders takes a picture that gives humanity its first look at our home as it really is. Earthrise. All of the views of the Earth from the moon have uh, let the uh, human race and its political leaders and its environmental leaders and its citizenry realize that we're all jammed together on one really kind of dinky little planet and we better treat it and ourselves better or we're not going to be here very long. As fate would have it, it is Christmas Eve. NASA has planned a live television broadcast from around the moon. We were told that we would have the largest audience that ever listened to a human voice when we made our TV broadcast from uh, the moon on Christmas Eve. And the only instructions that we got from NASA, do something appropriate. The largest audience in history. The first words from another world. But what should they say? I didn't want to take the time to worry about that when we had so much else. And Cy Borgen, who was a friend of ours with the U.S. Information Agency, suggested, how about reading from Genesis? So that's how it happened. times in my life when uh, I've been uh, brought to tears by the just the power the immensity uh, the beauty of what we what we were doing and this was one of those days and God saw that it was good and from the crew of Apollo 8 we close with good night good luck a Merry Christmas and God bless all of you all of you on the good earth As soon as the thing was cut off, we talked to the ground. I said, did you get all that? They said, yeah. Did it come in fine? Yes. Uh, okay, now give us the instructions for getting home. Getting home depends on a single engine. There's no backup. If it fails, they're stuck at the moon without hope of rescue. That caught my attention a lot. We knew we would be there forever if, indeed, that engine didn't work again. So that was a sobering thought. I think the uh, premiere of all the tense moments was the the uh, burn to get us back out of lunar orbit. The, uh, we only had a uh, single engine to do that, and had it failed, we'd still be circling the moon. So uh, every, I can assure you there were six eyeballs focused on those instruments. Well, uh, we were talking about the, what we called the TEI burn, the trans-Earth injection, and of course we spent 20 hours going around <laughs> the moon and we were all kind of tired, and, and so we were programming the computer to, uh, to turn on the engine and get the proper attitude. 
Uh, and as we got around the backside, because this burn starts on the backside, so no one can hear us from the earth. And on the computer, uh, it comes up a little sign that says, a couple numbers See. that essentially says, are you really sure that you want to make this maneuver? This is your last chance to make up a decision. So I said, Frank, hey, do we want to <laughs> Frank says, push the button, push the button. <laughs> I'll never forget that. The engine works. They're on a path back toward the Earth. But how accurate is their course? In three days, Apollo 8 will hit the Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles an hour. They must come in at exactly the right angle. Too shallow, and Apollo 8 will skip off like a stone on water. Too steep, and they will be incinerated. And we had to come 240,000 miles to hit something that was a, a re-entry target about the size of a letter slot seen from about four miles away. We had to s slide the letter into that slot. And the initial throw was good enough that that letter went right through the middle of it. On the re-entry, Bill hadn't flown before, so Lovell and I were kidding him all the time about how exciting the re-entry was going to be and this and that and the other thing, and that don't worry, we were going to be all right. And then about halfway through the re-entry, the Apollo was so much more spectacular than Gemini that Lovell and I were both scared. <laughs> we shut up. Yeah. You remember that? With its Earthrise photograph and reading of Genesis, Apollo 8 has struck a universal chord, moving the human spirit all across the world. I think the high point of my space career was Apollo 8. I say that because we are the first three people to leave the Earth, to go to the moon, to see the moon, uh, the far side, but also the first people to see the Earth as it really is. And it has accomplished its original mission as well. It got to the moon before the Russians. Realizing that we had done our job well, that we'd beat the Russians to the moon, and there was no doubt in my mind now that the rest of the program was, uh, uh, was uh, gonna work. I had a feeling uh, almost of euphoria. I was so, so pleased. I was so thankful for, you know, because let's face it, God must have been looking after us or we wouldn't have made it. So it was a very, very, very religious experience for me. Bill had an interesting comment when we landed because someone, while we were waiting to be picked up, someone had called from the ship or the helicopter and said, is the, is the moon made out of green cheese? Yeah. And Bill says, nope, it's American cheese. <laughs> Geez, I remember that like yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Apollo 8 has traveled nearly half a million miles and paved the way for the flights to follow. All that remains to fulfill Kennedy's promise is the landing. Eisenhower creates the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. NASA announces Project Mercury, a program to put an American in space. These ladies and gentlemen are the nation's Mercury astronauts. The seven Mercury astronauts become instant heroes, Cold War warriors, ready to battle communism in space. Future celebrities like Alan Shepard, and John Glenn are the public face of America's space program. 
But even the Mercury astronauts had no idea what was already going on behind the scenes at a little-known NASA laboratory. Here at the Langley Research Center in Virginia is where Apollo began. Even today, few Americans realize that in the 1950s, a tiny group of engineers was already planning trips to the moon. They were called the Space Task Group, visionaries dreaming remarkable dreams. One of them, Dr. Maxime Faget, will become a legend, helping to create every American manned spacecraft. In 1958, he's designing the Mercury capsule. We expected to land on the moon sooner or later because it was so close and because everybody could see the moon. It, it, it made a very good target. In the 1950s, travel to the moon is about to become possible because of the rocket. Long used as a weapon, the rocket is the only engine that can operate in a vacuum. Rockets are becoming more powerful in order to carry nuclear bombs. Some of them can now reach space. For an astronaut to survive there, he'll need the protection of a spacecraft or capsule. Even a small capsule will need a huge rocket to put it in space. Overcoming gravity takes enormous amounts of fuel. So the rocket is divided into stages. As each one burns its fuel, it drops away to save weight. By the time the capsule finally reaches space, the rocket that put it there is gone. Weight is a problem for the engineers from the beginning, and it will affect every decision they make. The most basic is how they will go to the moon, what the engineers call the mode. There are two possibilities. The first, direct ascent, uses a single rocket to send a spacecraft to the moon. It's the way people have always imagined going. But sending the spacecraft all that way will take an enormous rocket, larger than the Statue of Liberty, a monster called Nova. There were actually designs for the Nova rocket, but uh, could you build it? And the real issue about the Nova rocket is the question is, could you build it? And if you did have a problem with it, it could really destroy a good part of the Cape Kennedy at the time because it was such a massive amount of propellant. Werner von Braun favors a different mode, Earth Orbit Rendezvous, EOR. EOR uses two smaller rockets. One sends up the spacecraft, the other sends up the fuel. The astronauts rendezvous with the fuel tank, fill up their spacecraft, and head for the moon. Direct ascent is simple, but needs a huge rocket. Earth Orbit Rendezvous uses smaller rockets, but it's more complicated. Picking the mode will be the most critical decision in the Apollo program, because it determines everything. The spacecraft, the rocket. For as long as humans have gazed at the moon, some have dreamed of exploring our nearest neighbor this mysterious object of wonder. But when future generations look back, they may be surprised to learn why men first went to the moon. Because the ancient dream of exploration had almost nothing to do with what was called Project Apollo. Any idea that the Apollo program was a great voyage of exploration or scientific endeavor is nuts. People just aren't that excited about exploration. They were sure excited about beating the Russians. On October 4th, 1957, Russia orbits the first man-made satellite in history, Sputnik. To many Americans, it's a shocking defeat, a Pearl Harbor in space. It is quite possible 
and an aggressor nation that dominates space will then dominate the world. We just can't let that happen. The, uh, consider the control of speed around the Earth uh, much like, uh, shall we see, the great maritime powers considered the control of the seas in the 16th through the 18th century. And uh, they say if we want to control this planet, we have to control the speeds around it. Dr. Werner von Braun is America's leading rocket scientist, a German engineer who created the V-2 rocket for Hitler in World War II. He now works for the U.S. Army. For years, von Braun has dreamed of exploring space. Thanks to the Russians, he'll get the chance. Nine months after Sputnik, President... The training, budget, and schedule. The wrong choice means losing to the Russians, and maybe not reaching the moon at all. The answer was one nobody expected. The engineer who lobbied for it was an outsider. He didn't belong to the space task group and never worked for von Braun. Almost no one welcomed the idea, but he never gave up. The story of his struggle is largely unknown. But the plan he promoted got America to the moon. His name is Dr. John Hobold. In 1959, he's adamant both modes, direct and Earth orbit rendezvous, will fail because the spacecraft needed to land on the moon is much too large. It was a vehicle about the size of an atlas. Down at the Cape, it takes 3,000 men, a launch pad, and a launch facilities to get an atlas off the ground from the Earth. They were going to land something the size of an atlas on the moon backwards with no help whatsoever. I thought that was preposterous. Hobolt suggests not taking the main spacecraft down to the moon at all. Instead, the astronauts will use a separate lander, a small taxi, or bug. One time we called it the lunar excursion vehicle, sometimes we called it the bug, sometimes we called it the lunar schooner. But the idea was that we go there, we go into an <clears throat> orbit around the moon, then make a decision to land, so we would land with the small lander, but keep the command module in orbit. He was the lonely vigil observing everything. After we explored, we'd take off again, as ascend, make the rendezvous again with the uh, command module, dispense with the lander because it's done its job, and then we'd return to Earth in a very normal way. This is Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, LOR. By using a separate lander and not taking the mothership down to the moon, LOR saves fuel and weight. Hobolt promises LOR can get America to the moon with one rocket, and it won't have to be the huge Nova. But the astronaut's safe return depends on rendezvous, something no one's ever done, even around the Earth. Hobolt's plan requires that rendezvous work perfectly at the moon. To almost everyone, that seems insane. Well, when I first heard about lunar orbit rendezvous, I said, my gosh, <laughs> we don't even know how to rendezvous in Earth orbit yet. No. <laughs> How, how are we going to be able to assure ourselves that, that uh, we could get the two vehicles together in orbit and, and dock together at the moon? That seemed like a very chancy thing. Uh, I remember expressions like, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of, the most unsafe thing. How could anybody go up there and land and, and rendezvous 250,000 miles away? John Hobolt goes on a crusade for LOR making presentation after presentation. Though he did not invent the idea alone, Hobolt has become its main advocate, and he's beginning to annoy some powerful critics, like Max Faget. Well, Hobolt was a rather pushy guy, there's no doubt about it. There were a lot of people who had their minds made up that we already knew how we were going to do it. And he had considerable discussion and argument, uh, some of it pretty heated. At a meeting, here in headquarters, 
Max Fishing got up on that table and pounded. And he says, don't you listen to him. Don't listen. He, his figures lie. His figures lie. We had this, this little discussion going, which <laughs> personalities got involved. <laughs> to some degree that he was crucified that day, uh, uh, chastised, um, uh, the system uh, was considered.